morning. Good morning. I'd like to say uh, I really do appreciate Derek's community meditation. Uh, it, Holy Spirit uh, kind of spoke to me this morning through that meditation. I really do appreciate it. Put some things in perspective. I do remember reading one time that the Golgotha, which is translated the place of the skull where Jesus was crucified, was just outside the city wall and not far from the city gate. And I never really thought about that until you mentioned it this morning and I put it in perspective. And, and uh, all the Roman paintings and pictures of crucifixions were right along the streets and were only a few inches off the ground and I never considered... That, that was good. It, it, it brought some intimacy. It, you know, my point is this. You have, a, you have different parts of the service this morning that can minister to you. Something in the sermon, but it's possible you don't get anything out of the sermon, but you get something out of the songs we sang this morning, and you remember some of the lyrics that you sang, and, and that ministered to you. Um, however God wants to speak to you this morning, would you have an open heart and an open mind to, to be attentive to that? I say that because what we're getting ready to look at is one of the most misunderstood passages in the Bible on both sides. It's most misunderstood by non-Christians, yet it's more quoted by non-Christians than any other verse of Scripture. And Christians sometimes avoid the passage because we know it, and we don't fully understand what it means. Yet we all have a problem judging others. And that's what it's about this morning. And let me tell you something. When I sit down to prepare a series through the Bible, I don't necessarily go through and read it, the book for the purpose of, okay, I know so-and-so struggles with this in their life, so I can't wait to get that, that point and really hit it hard. And I know so-and-so over here struggles with this area, and, and I, can't, you know, I don't do that. Um, it many times as I'm going through and preparing the sermons, God is actually kicking my hind in because I might struggle with some of those things. So it's not that if something jumps out at you and you feel threatened or attacked or God or, or, or the preacher stepping on your toes, just understand this is God's word and I'm just going through it. But I want you to understand I had a little bit of an issue with this myself and uh, there's some changes that have been made. I hope you are open enough to understand some of these as well. So we go to Matthew chapter 7. And like I said, it's one of the most quoted <laughs> verses of Scripture. Especially by non-Christians. And I'll tell you why it's, it's quoted by them. Because they don't <coughs> want to be examined of sin that's in their life. And let me ask you this. Is it our duty as Christians to judge a person? We're going to answer some of those questions this morning. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, but pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So there's a couple of things that's going on right here. Jesus plainly says something. Do not judge. That's the first verse. That's the first verse in chapter 7. Do not judge. Now, can I actually e examine that away? Can I... Um, do all those things of what Jesus says. <coughs> Is there a Greek word that I can explain that says it doesn't really mean this, but what it means? No. The Bible says, do not judge, or 
you too will be judged. Plain and simple. Yet, Christians are the first to judge others without thinking that they will be judged. And I don't know why we do that. But I have some theories. I think some theories that we, the reason we do that is to um, let the other person feel inferior. Show us, or, or let us show our inferior to somebody else. There are two problems. I want you to write this down in your bulletin. Or at least try to memorize it. But there are two problems with those who are in Christ who condemn. Let me back up one more time. Now let me say this. Christ condemned sin. He judged sinful people. There's a way he did it, and there's a way we should do it. And, and sometimes the, the two biggest problems for those who are in Christ who condemn, who judge, is this. Number one, they judge or condemn sin and stop right there. That's what they do. They'll judge somebody's sinful life, they'll condemn somebody for a way that they're living, and they stop. They don't go any further. You, you call somebody out. Well, you know, my neighbor, and they can hear you say this, you know, is blah, blah, blah. And that's where you stop. Let me tell you, that's wrong. We don't judge somebody and stop. You must offer <coughs> other action for the sin to the person or a society that is caught up in sin. You must, if you judge them, offer a way out. I was going to show a video, and it's not working right, but I was going to show a video where uh, a teenage girl, she doesn't speak in a video, but she holds up cards. And in the video, she would hold up the card and says, I am a Christian, and I used to judge people. And, and she would go through that, and, and it comes around where she realized that her judging other people was never led one person to Christ. When she judged another sinful person who is not a Christian, she realized in her life it never led anybody to repentance. And she discovered that the only time she led other people to repentance, which was few, was when she loved them and not judged them. Let me ask you a plain and simple question. Is this world full of sin? Most definitely. And are there people who are caught up in sin? Most definitely. I'm jumping ahead, but I'm going to hit this again. But let me just say this. The Bible teaches us that we aren't who judge the world, but we are to judge those who are in Christ. And we'll come back to that. So number one, they condemn, condemn sin or judge sin and stop there. And they don't offer any other action. Number two, they condemn or judge sin and do it, away, do it in a way that's offensive. <coughs> they get a joy or a kick out of condemning other people. Christ never, ever condemned another person. And one, never offered an out. And two, did it because he despised somebody. Whenever he would condemn the Pharisees, whenever he called them whitewashed tombs or a brood of vipers, or he called them names, and he would judge their lifestyle, he still explained why and what they needed to do. In Matthew chapter 7, I believe it is, or uh, 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 John chapter 7, and I'll try to find that verse of scripture later on, the story is this. Jesus heals a man who was blind, but he does it in a way where he spits mud, or he spits on the ground, makes mud, puts it in a guy's eyes, and tells him to go wash. Well, the Pharisees come by later and say, who healed you? And he goes, I don't know. I didn't see them. Okay? I, I was blind. Jesus told me to wash it 
and I didn't see the man, so I can't point him out to you. Now, here's what he was doing. He was blind, sitting at the temple gate, begging for money. Jesus comes by a few hours later, and what's the man who was blind doing? The man who was blind, who can now see, is doing the same thing he was doing when he was blind. And here's Jesus' words, and I quote verbatim, Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. Verbatim. That's what Jesus said. Who, what did Jesus do? He judged him. Did he hate him? No. But he healed him. He told him to stop doing it because if you don't, you're going to get caught up into this. Things are going to get worse for you. I believe we would all agree that sin is sin and you can't candy coat or rationalize it. Sin is offensive to God. So first Jesus plainly says, don't judge. And we can't change the text. We can't change what it says. We can only abide or obey that scripture. Why does Jesus, in the very first verse of chapter 7, why does Jesus give us a warning of judging others? Here's the warning. Do not judge or you will be judged. That's the warning. That's the reason. Jesus says, don't you judge or you will be judged. But it's not just simply being judged. What, are you, what will happen? Here's what he says. Okay, so if I'm going to sit here and, and, and I'm going to judge Phyllis for something, okay? All right? I cannot think of a thing what I would judge Phyllis about, but I'm just going to judge Phyllis. And I use this harsh measure of judgment. And I say, Phyllis, so-and-so lives a life that's so-and-so and is caught up in things and other stuff. And you're a sinner and going to hell and all this other stuff. What's the problem? Here's the problem. Jesus says, if I'm going to judge Phyllis, the measure that I use to place a judgment on her will also be used on me. Look what he says. For in the same way... You judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. <clears throat> Here's a couple of things that come to my mind about judging others. One, it's probably best for me not to judge others because I can be pretty harsh. And if I can be pretty harsh in judging other people, then God has the right to judge me with the same measure that I judge other people. How about that? And I, I, I can be pretty harsh on a lot of people who call themselves Christians, and that's different. But when it comes to a person who's out of Christ, who's not a Christian, I better be careful what I do, what I say, and the measure I use. So who is Jesus talking to when he says, don't judge or you will be judged. And as hard as you judge somebody, it's going to be applied to you. Who is he talking to? He's talking to people who are seeking the truth. Now in the crowd are people that have somehow caught on to what Jesus has said and what he has done. And he has attracted himself to them. And they come out to see him. And they come out to hear him. And they linger on every word he says. And now there are some Pharisees who have come out, but they're not there to gain insight and wisdom and hear what God is saying, they're there to judge Jesus. Okay? But the crowd, for the most part, have come out. And for the crowd, especially for the Pharisees, they feel that they're right with God, and God, through Jesus, has been telling them, not so fast. You may not be right with me. The whole Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> excuse me, the whole Sermon on the Mount is about reality check, spiritual reality check. You think you're right with me, but you may not be. And then he comes, after he says all of that, then he comes to a place where he says, therefore, don't judge somebody, because you may not be right with me as much as you think you are. And here's the problem. <laughs> the people thought, felt, believed that they were right with God. And here's why. They 
did their best to obey the law of Moses. Second, they made sacrifices. Now, the sacrifices were commanded in the law of Moses to do, to cover up, roll back, push back your sin for one year. So if you come to the altar and you present your sacrifice to the priest, he ties the lamb down on the altar, he ties it down, and then he, he slits its throat. The lamb eventually dies. Then they do some things with the blood, and they do some things with the lamb, and they offer it as a sacrifice to God. And here's the thing. God was not power-hungry wanting a grotesque sacrifice. He wanted us to look at the lamb and the blood pumping out of its neck to show us what our sins have done. Now here's the thing. There, there are two things. If they sacrifice or try to obey the law, here's the thing. Anybody can sacrifice, but not everybody can obey the law of God. So what did they pride themselves on? Sacrifices. Anybody can sacrifice, but not everybody can obey the law of God. And you had to do both to be righteous before God. It's like this. Anybody can come to church and sit in a pew. But not everybody will take heed to the words of God. Amen. We're in the same boat. So Jesus says to us from chapter 5 to where we are in chapter 7, check you're right because you may not be right with me. And here are some measures to see if you're right with me. And we've gone over there. And let me tell you something. Last Sunday was a beautiful moment for me. And I believe it was a beautiful moment for our church. Amen. When the people walked forward. I've never experienced that. And when the people came forward. Last week, all of you. Half the congregation. And I believe the other half who didn't come forward still made their decisions in a correct measure. But here's the thing. Did God not move in a mighty and powerful way within our church? Amen. And you know, it's nothing that we've done. It was everything that he's done. I'm just glad I was the poor schlep that happened to be here. That's all I'm happy about. So they sacrifice. Well, we all sacrifice, don't we? But it's very hard for all of us to obey God. And that was the problem with what Jesus was saying. And so the people who were listening to him were good Jewish people who may or may not have followed the law with all of their heart, but they sure did sacrifice. And Jesus come to fulfill the law to take away the sacrifice. So once Jesus dies on the cross, there is no need for people to bring a lamb or a pigeon or, or you know, a clean animal to be sacrificed to God because of their sins. Why? Because Jesus now has done that. So his listeners were those who sacrificed what was needed at the times and it was commanded and they tried to keep the law. And here's the thing, anyone can do that. Here's another idea. Anybody can ask for forgiveness. But not everybody repents. So not only did you sacrifice, which was easier to keep the law, but you also felt, because you did that, that you were holier or more righteous than, than anybody else. And here's what Jesus said in chapter 5. Jesus says, unless you're... Righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, you think you're holy? you got to be holier than, than those who feel that they're holier than everybody else, the Pharisees. <coughs> Jesus was saying, you're not all of that in a bag of chips. If anybody watched Fuller House or Full House. Who can do that? Who has ever lived that's more righteous 
than the most righteous person, Jesus Christ. Who's ever lived before Jesus that was the most righteous person? Was it Moses? Though he was given the law by God himself, he was excluded from entering the promised land because he wasn't good enough. Was it King David? God himself said, here's a man after my own heart, yet was not allowed to build the temple because his hands were full of sin. Now here's the thing, God has raised up fallible people to do and proclaim judgments on a people or a nation. And here are a few examples, Sodom and Gomorrah, Nineveh, Jonah chapter 1, Canaanites, Genesis 15, Israel's captivity, <coughs> Jeremiah 25. Here are areas where prophets were raised up to judge the nation. God sent word through someone specific for specific reasons. There's even a book in the Bible called Judges. What did they do, Judge? So let's get in that time machine and move back towards Jesus. Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2, the first thing that he says is do not judge. And the reason is you ain't good enough to judge unless you've taken care of your own problems. Because you see right here, he says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Can I explain to you what a speck is and what a plank is? Somebody will look at somebody, no, let's say, okay, I know that the, this person uh, committed adultery. And so I go to them and I say, judge you because you've committed adultery. I condemn what you've done. It is wrong. Shame on you. Blah, blah, blah. Yet, I might look at pornography and lust. Now, what did Jesus say about that? Jesus says, if you lust, it's as if you've committed adultery. So I'm looking at a speck with a plank. So I go to somebody and I say, you know, you took the life of somebody. God's going to get you for that. And you're going to burn in hell. I've judged them. Yet, I've hated somebody or harbored such deep resentment. And Jesus says, someone may murder, but if you have hatred in your heart, it's as if you've committed murder. I could go to a woman and say to her, you've killed a baby that was in the womb that God put together and that he knitted. Shame on you. You will burn in hell unless you change your life. Abortion is wrong. And yet, I hate the abortion doctors. I despise them. This is, what's the difference? And, and you see, this is what Jesus is saying. When he says, why do you look at the speck of salt dust? Most of the time when we judge somebody else, it's not as worse, it's not as bad as what we are dealing with. A lot of times we look at a speck in another person's eye and we say, well, let's, you know, look at Derek. He's covered in tattoos. You know, poor Sap, he's marked his body up. That's a sin. Well, first of all, it doesn't say in the Bible that's a sin. It does talk about marking your body to false gods, but it doesn't say anything. And so we might look at him, and because we don't like tattoos, and my mom was the biggest. We might not like tattoos. My dad told me, you can get a tattoo when you're no longer in this house. So when I moved away, a year back, when I came back, I said, Dad, I'm going to get a tattoo. You know what he says? I'll go with you. So he was with me when I got my first tattoo. And here's the thing. He didn't condemn me or didn't judge me, but he said to the tattoo artist while they were pinning my shoulder, he goes, you think you could tattoo a fly on the end of my nose? That's my dad. So we might look at somebody and say, you're full of tattoos. Yet our heart is marked with sin and resentment. Our minds are covered with horrible tattoos of what we do when we judge other people. So we look at a speck, but we don't consider the plank in our eye. Here's what I'm saying. 
Here's what Jesus is saying. Before you think you can judge somebody, get your life right. And the problem is a lot of us think we're right when we proclaim judgment. And Jesus is saying, check every aspect of your heart and your mind. And this was a message for Jake. Here are some reasons why we shouldn't judge. And I'm almost done. We should never judge if we are struggling with the same sin or those that are just as bad as somebody else. Number one, do not judge other people if you are struggling with the same sin or something that's just as bad. We often tell people what they are doing is wrong, yet we either do the very same thing or things that are just as great. And this is what I was good at for many years. Somebody called me on the carpet and I would project somewhere else of somebody who was doing something worse than me. Jake, blah, 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 you shouldn't, da, 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 da. Yeah, but have you seen this other guy over here, what he's doing? You're judging me? I did that. I was good at that. I was the king of that. We judge someone who is cheating on their spouse, yet we lust after other people ourselves. We condemn someone who is a liar, when, but yet when we lie, we can either rationalize it or justify it. We judge someone who gets all of <clears throat> any number of these things, and yet we do them too. But what did Jesus say in verses 1 and 2? And what did he say following? Don't judge. That's what he said. Now let me put this in perspective. We don't judge others unless we've removed all the same sins from our lives. We don't judge others unless we have given, been given the commandment from Scripture to judge. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12. Listen to what Paul says about judgment. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Question mark. Are you not to judge those outside? Inside, question mark. <clears throat> the New Living Translation says it this way. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but certainly it is your responsibility to judge those who are in the church that are sinning. So here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12. Don't judge the world, because they're not going to change. When you place judgment on the world and how bad they are, you know what? You're not doing anything. But now if somebody is in the church and they are sinning, you have every right to go to them. But remember what Jesus says. Make sure your life is right. But you go to them. And how do you do it? You go to them in love. Why do you do it? Because they are sinning. Let me give you an example. I'm not going to tell you who I'm voting for. Because to, to be honest with you, I don't like any of the choices that are still there. And God in heaven, I ask you, please, in the name of Jesus, raise somebody up who will leave this country. So, if I'm not going to judge anybody that's outside the church, but I judge somebody that claims to be in the church, let me tell you, I got my gun loaded. Now let me tell you this. If Donald Trump did not say he was not a Christian, I would have no problem with what he's doing. Well, I, I would, but I wouldn't judge him. But because Donald Trump on several occasions has said, I am a Christian, and because he has held up the Bible and he says that I believe that this is God's word, then I could judge him for the way he treats other people. I could judge him on a statement he made when somebody said, when they were talking about forgiveness of sins, you know what Donald Trump said? I've never asked God to forgive me of sin. 1 John says, if you claim to be without sin, you make God out to be a liar. Now, I'm not telling you 
I am not telling you, I am not telling you to vote or not to vote for anybody. You got to vote for the best choice available. See, I can also go on the other side of the aisle politically to people who claim to be a Christian and look at what they have done. You can look at your preacher and judge me when I sin or if I'm caught up in sin. Now, there's a difference between, you know, committing a sin at the spur of the moment and then me repenting about it but, or me, and here's what Paul's talking about, me committing a sin, staying there, living there, wallowing in it, making it part of my life. Then you have the responsibility to come to me. I have the responsibility to go to you. I have offended several people because I've done it in love. But I've, I've offended several people who have come to me and wanted to get married and living with the person they wanted to get married who claim to be a Christian. And I say, you either need to split up, break up, or move out before we go any further. Well, why do I have to do that? Because living with a person before you're married with them, the Bible says is a sin. Amen. So in love, I tell them, you need to move out. You need to change you can still get married. We can still work on this. God can still bless your relationship, but you're not going to have a blessing from God in a relationship that starts out the way it's starting out. What's Paul doing? He's showing us how God is mad at sin. In Romans chapter 1, there are specific sins that are an abomination to God. There are specific sins that are an abomination to God. And Paul says in verse 18 that God's wrath, whose wrath? God's wrath is being poured out. It's being revealed to all godliness and wickedness. Who is God judging? All wickedness, all godlessness. Who's doing the judging? Whose wrath is being revealed? God's wrath. And it's because they're not glorifying God or giving thanks to Him. And, but he goes through a whole list of things. Let me go through a few of those lists where, why God is mad. Homosexuality, worshiping nature rather than the creator of nature. And you, you can read the rest of it, okay? You can read the rest of it. But here's what is, what's Paul doing. He is showing us how God is mad and how he is judging the world. We have the same task when God calls out sin in the Bible to, uh, from Scripture to talk to somebody about the sin, but it must be in love and it must be within the church. I've heard it said, and probably said it myself, that this world is doomed for hell because of the wickedness. And I believe that because it's in the Scriptures. However, I'm to go to the person who's caught up in sin outside of the church and share with them the news of Jesus. And I have to go to the person who's caught up in sin inside the church and share them the message of repentance. Just one more finish up. What's the message? Number one, God loves the world and he gave us Jesus. Number two, that we must believe in Jesus. Who is he? He's the Son of God. If we believe if we believe, we will not die an eternal death. God, number five, God didn't send Jesus to condemn the world, but to save the world. What? What? What scripture is that? John 3.17. Who said that? Gold star. Check mark. John 3.17. The most popular verse in the Bible is, For God so loved the world that he gave his only one son. Whoever believes in him shall not die, but have everlasting life. I think I used like four different different translations to get through that. But here's what it says in 17. For God did not send Jesus to what? To condemn the world, but to what? Save the world. We are not in the condemning business. We are in the saving business. The showing repentance business. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. And that's what needless do. Those, number six, those who choose to believe will not suffer condemnation. And lastly, those who refuse to accept the truth of who Jesus is, is condemned already. So let's read 17 again. 
God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but to save the world. Listen. He goes on to say that if you're a believer, you're not condemned. But if you don't believe in Jesus, you stand condemned already. So as we close, and as we get ready to sing our invitation, it might be a hard sermon to grasp and to understand, but this is it. We are not the judges of the world. Now I can stand in a picket line at an abortion clinic and protest. 